A vertical farm, in my view, is any indoor farming operation that exceeds a standard one-story building. If it's two stories, that's a vertical farm. If it's a warehouse that's as tall as a two-story building but only one floor inside, that's still a vertical farm as long as you fill the space up inside. So then, okay, so this idea circulated through a course that I taught called Medical Ecology, all right? Crazy title, but I taught at a medical school, so that's, that's the way that worked, to attract students to the subject. And this thing grew into a formal website thing, and of course you expect everybody to kill it and, okay, move on to something else. And the opposite thing happened. Everybody that knew how to use AutoCAD submitted a diagram or a beautiful drawing of mostly impractical stuff, but still it, it attracted attention to it. More designers got involved, some city planners. The next thing you know, somebody was building one. So then I decided to write a book, oddly called The Vertical Farm, <laughs> um, which received enormous um, professional praise from the press. And The Guardian trashed it three different ways and backwards and forwards and upside down. And The Economist was kind of lukewarm on it. But since then, there have been many articles written in both of those illustrious papers. Some favor, some don't favor, but at least they, bal they balanced out the arguments. Okay, so since 2010 when the book came out, which doesn't tell you how to build a vertical farm because nobody had built one before, so how could I be the first person to say that? All I said was why we should build them. So the biggest question is, well, why even talk about this? Why, why is this a topic today? And even in 2000, when I first started to think about this, the climate change people convinced me that there was something else going on besides normal climate change. So it was rapid climate change. And it doesn't mean rapid climate warming or rapid climate cooling. It just means that wherever you live, if you get the weather reports every day for 10 years, you're not going to believe the differences. And that shouldn't be happening, to be honest. That, that really is unprecedented in the Earth's history, except for catastrophic volcanoes and stuff like this. So we are the volcano. We are the meteor that hit the Earth that altered life on Earth. So if we want to rectify that in the best way we know, we have to use our technology and our brains to work our way out of a problem that we created. And we created this problem. So Food and water are our biggest needs, and food comes from the land. Everybody knows that, but not anymore. It can't come from the land anymore because we've used it all up. So let's go back just before there was agriculture. Now, we don't know exactly when that is, but the first in irrefutable evidence that says, yes, this was a plant that man or humans created from hybridization with wild plants to make it totally dependent upon human activity, like watering and keeping out the pests, was corn. And that, that corn was created in the Balsas Valley of Mexico, uh, which is in the southern part of Mexico, around 11,700 years ago. Okay, so, so I like to say 15,000 years ago, well, there were probably no farms. And there were, it, we estimate there were about a million people total. And they were wandering all over the earth, seeking their fortunes <laughs> in the form of migrating buffalo or <laughs> a mammoth or two that happened to still be alive. But life was kind of uninteresting. There were no written languages. There was no math. There was no music that we knew about. Uh, there were, well, I, when I say no written languages, no, but there were languages, tons of them. And they were all related to, oh, look, there goes an elephant. Let's walk around that way and kill it or don't step on that plant, I just harvested it. Uh, all those things uh, were practical applications of utterances, okay? So the very first building ever, it isn't far from here actually, it's in Ireland. It's called New Grange. What do you think it is? It's an observatory, just like Stonehenge. And it, it marks the summer solstice. And why did they need to know that? Because that's when the plants grew. Okay, okay, so plants, language, music, culture, cities, that all started 10,000 years ago. A million people. Today, seven billion people. And farming that takes up the size of South America when you put all the land together as to how much we actually farm. So 
we have exceeded our fair share and we have sacrificed how many millions of species and how many uh, billions of individual animals and plants in favor of these domesticated versions that we call food. So I think it's wrong, by the way. I think there's a moral and ethical uh, violation of the principle of DNA and its ability to create variety and, and life, and integration of life. We are doing the opposite. Farms are anti-ecological, anti, because there's only one crop. And then we harvest it at the end. We don't even allow it to reseed itself. We actually control it as best we can. And of course, we did a good job of that, so up into a point. And then in about 1980, it became obvious that what we were doing, if we continued, was going to have catastrophic effects on our own lives. And so we became concerned, not before that. Were we concerned that we eliminated 80% of the hardwood forest of the world? No. In favor of farmland? Heck no. We didn't care as long as we benefited. And everything was uh, very, very homo-centric. Uh, and they, they actually have a new word for this era that human beings now live in. It's called the Anthropocene. They, they created a term for it to say, before the Anthropocene, here's the way the world worked. And then after the Anthropocene, here's the way the world worked. And it's totally different, right? Even the dinosaurs didn't affect life on Earth the way we're expecting it right now. So, so if, you, if you're a biologist and you pay attention to the literature, no matter whether you're interested in the molecular machinations of a parasite, which I used to be, or the way in which all of life integrates itself into a network of ecological relationships, which I am now interested in, it's all the same. It is exactly the same. The same requires integration and cooperation at the molecular level to create metabolism and at the uh, macro level to create uh, a livable environment. So vertical farming hopes to create a livable environment for our food, just our food, and us so that we can live peacefully in cities without worrying about where it comes from. And if you do that and leave the country alone, it will take care of itself, guaranteed. So the concept of vertical farming started, let's say, 10 years ago, maybe even before that, but I was not aware of that. Okay, so other people have used different terms to describe the same thing. Frank Lloyd Wright, for instance, the architect, or uh, uh, John Todd, who's an ecologist. In fact, if you just turned the camera around and pointed it out that way, that looks like a reclaimed area <laughs> that was turned into an artificial wetland. He would love that environment because that's remediating something. All right, it's, it's creating diversity, it's creating variety, it's allowing for integration to occur. This has health benefits. It's peaceful to look at, it's wonderful. It's, it's a very lovely integration of the built environment and the natural world side by side. That's possible, here's the proof. Okay, so, so vertical farming says, let's do that. Well, in Japan, they had several events that uh, altered their lives forever, and the first was the earthquake, followed by the tsunami followed by the meltdown at Fukushima. All of those were related, and Sendai, the, the city nearest the Fukushima reactor, was inundated by the tsunami. Now, what did that mean? They lost 5% of their farmland in 20 minutes. It just disappeared. Now, 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you look at how many people live in Japan and how dependent upon that little land they are for their food, then it represented a, a catastrophe. So they began to ramp up an already existing set of uh, research uh, agenda, which uh, said, how do you grow food indoors? And how do you grow a lot of food indoors? So they, they call them plant factories. They don't call them uh, vertical farms, because a lot of them are only single stories. But many are higher than that. And, and one of them, at least, New Veggie, calls itself a vertical farm, which is great. So in 2010, some, well, it was before that, I'm sure, but in 2010, a building was erected in Tokyo, which is nine stories tall, which is an integrated building. And by that, I mean that people who go to work there work in human resources. They plan people's retirement benefits. They work on taxes. They do all kinds of other boring things. <laughs> I think those are boring things. Essential, but boring. But they have an interesting life. Why? Because if they want to go to lunch, there's no excuse for going out and having lunch and coming home late. 
because lunch is served indoors. The foyer of that building is a rice factory, right? It's, it's planted, it's very large. It's about maybe, uh, of maybe the size of a, a half of a soccer field. And in, inside of that facility, you can go downstairs from work, grab a handful of rice, harvest it, bring it up, winnow it, bring it to the chef, and then go pick tomatoes on another floor, pick green beans, pick leafy greens, hand it all to the chef, there's your raw materials, make me something interesting. And the next thing you know, 20 minutes later, you're sitting down and you're eating it. And so that food is like less than 20 minutes old. You have no idea of how that tastes. It's fantastic. Anybody who's ever been to a farm and just picked the produce and popped it in their mouth, like strawberries and things like that, it's unbelievably delicious. Why aren't we doing more of that? Well, this is a new building. This was uh, 2010, and I must say that it probably violated virtually every building code known to people throughout the world. How can you possibly put edible plants in the, per in the same place that you put people? That's crazy. Why are you doing this? And yet, it's the envy of the entire architectural world because it gives purpose to a building. It doesn't generate CO2. It doesn't take up space. It doesn't throw off heat. It actually creates oxygen. It feeds people. It draws them to work. So take that one example. That's a small example. Now create a city out of it. And you're only limited by your imagination as to what that city is going to look like. It's the edible city, basically. And there's a book by that title, by the way, The Edible City, but it, it doesn't exactly address that issue. But if you said, from now on, all of the new architecture has to include recycling gray water, rainwater harvesting, no CO2 emissions. Why? Because we grow plants inside that trap that. And then some portion of the plants that you're growing have to be edible plants. If that's the building codes from now on, you've got yourself a technological equivalent of an ecosystem. Nothing better than that. Do you know who my most appreciative audiences are? Third and fifth graders. <laughs> because they have no preconceived ideas about this whatsoever. Once you show them that this can work, that's what they want to do all day long. So there's a, a school in New York City called the Manhattan School for Children which is the first school in New York City allowed to have a hydroponic greenhouse on their roof. And they teach science. It's called STEM. I don't know if you're familiar with the term. They teach it all based on hydroponic farming. And the first year they had it, the kids went home with uh, little cups full of uh, grape tomatoes. And the, the mothers and fathers would say, where did you get that? <laughs> he says, oh, we grew it at school. And they would say, no, you didn't. <laughs> they thought they stole off some cart, you know. They said, no, no, come to school the next day and you can see. And then, so they did, of course, and they couldn't believe what was going on. So they're very encouraging. And so I think many more schools will get this also. A vertical farm by itself is meaningless. What I want to see is a recovery of damaged ecosystems I want to see a lowering of the rise of climate change. I want to see a sucking out of the atmosphere of, of CO2 below a level which probably goes back to 1980, which was less than 300 parts per million. It's now over 400 parts per million. And it's going up. And it's going up. Um, what I want to see is for people, everybody, to set aside their differences and start emphasizing their commonalities. And, and one of them is that we're just people. It doesn't matter what you eat. You know, I hate to say it this way, but I'm a parasitologist. It doesn't matter what you eat, the same thing comes out every day. <laughs> now, how does that work? <laughs> that's, why don't we dwell on that for a moment and say that's what makes us all the same? The one common thing we all have, and that is every day you eat, and every day you urinate, and every day you defecate. So what we do with those products is important. In nature, of course, it recycles and, and re-neutrifies the environment. What do we do with ours? And I know you know the answer. We discard it and we think it's yucky and we go, ooh. A common example right now is California. That whole state is suffering from a four-year drought. Why don't cities recycle their gray water? What is gray water? It's desludged black water, which is a raw mixture of urine and feces. So if you took out the solids and saved the liquid, and then recovered the water portion of the liquid, what would be wrong with that? 
And the answer is there are a couple places that actually do that. They're both in California, and the people wouldn't drink the water when they did it first because they knew where it came from. So they had to pour it over the ground and then recover that water from wells and say, no, no, your, your water doesn't come from over there, it comes from over here. <laughs> so people have these crazy ideas about this that, that doesn't jibe with the natural world. None of those animals and plants would ever reject a free meal, no matter what form it comes in, because free meals are hard to come by. And once those associations are made, they're never broken unless something catastrophic happens. With us, we're so used to processed things and so used to artificial things. What I mean by artificial, I mean not, not from nature. Things that we create ourselves, like high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> soy milk, come on. That, there's no reason soy should ever be called milk, <laughs> knowing where real milk comes from. So when you start to analyze the evolution of human behavior, you run up against these, I would call them puritanical views of the natural world. And there was a time when we were totally integrated with the natural world, and then there was a time when we weren't. And that, that occurred 10,000 years ago. As soon as we found out how to farm, we created cities. Cities were barriers to the natural world, basically. They were the difference between. And the more the difference, the better. Now, you know, to say that I, I, I'm not a hunter-gatherer any longer. I'm not any longer dependent upon you know, raw anything. I am a civilized person. <laughs> the, the defining civilization in those terms is, is the downfall of the human species, basically, because it really does say that you are different from a Darwinian perspective, and we know back in 1835 that Darwin, after having circled the Earth several times in the Beagle and coming back and making his at long last presentation in the 1850s, revolutionized the way we are supposed to look at life on Earth. But there is that, that undercurrent persistent other view that says, no, we're still different. And, but, so the, the, I think it's, I would call it the, um, the ethic of the DNA molecule, basically, okay? If you start with Escherichia coli, which is a component of our feces, and take its genome, and express that genome up through the phylogenetic tree of life, and ask, how many genes from Escherichia coli are still left when we reach, let's say, humans? The answer is, they're all still there. They've just been modified to do different things. So we take the same building materials and we modify them through mutation, and now they're the lens in our eye rather than a serine protease, which is, by the way, the, the fact of life. So why isn't that information filtering down to young people so that by the time they grow up, they, of course, they, they integrate life of all kinds because we're all part of that same scheme. And that, that's where we really fall down in not realizing that even though you've created all these beautiful edifices, and wonderful cultural barriers to encountering natural systems. You're still a natural system, I hate to say it, but you still are. And, um, and my, so my biggest hope for the future is that the more we integrate ecological processes into cities, the more it will become obvious to people that something similar to that exists in nature as well, and all we've done is mimic it. So by mimicking nature, we have revisited Leonardo da Vinci's laboratory. He takes a look at a bird and discusses how it flies in his drawings and everything else, and then, then he starts to fashion wings in the shapes of, you know, just like the wings of a bird. And eventually, of course, they have to be field tested. And they did, and, and some of his kites and flyers and parachutes, all that stuff works, because he was a keen observer of, of life. And that's where we get our ideas from. So, um, yeah, and, and by the way, of course, uh, when our life on Earth ends individually, what happens to it? It gets reintegrated. Every molecule, every atom gets reabsorbed by some other life form. So you don't actually die, but you don't realize you're still alive. <laughs> your, your essence never disappears. It's just reconfigured. <laughs> there was a wonderful series on American television. I don't know if it hit the BBC or not. It was called Cosmos by Carl Sagan. 
It was an old series back in the 1980s, I believe. It was revived again, decided to make a new series based on the same concepts but with new data called Cosmos. <laughs> Only it was just aired about a year ago uh, by uh, Neil uh, Tyson deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think that's his name. He's the astronomer royal, so to speak, for the American Museum of Natural History. And there were 13 of these presentations, each lasting about an hour. In number 12, near the end, he lamented in number 11 as to the ills of civilization and the effects it's going to have on the planet and projected into the future a pretty dismal view of what to expect if things continue on. But number 12 was, but wait a minute, what if we used all of our common sense and technology to make things better? And so the last five minutes of that, that show, which you can access on, online, by the way, so I highly recommend it, is to look at the expression of his wish that all of the energy on Earth is captured by wind and solar and geothermal, so there's no more fossil fuel burning, so therefore the CO2 budget of the atmosphere and the surface of the Earth comes back into balance. And then he takes you inside a city. There's no narration on this, so you could actually just roll it. I, I highly recommend it for this because the vision that he presents at the end shows vertical farms, basically. It shows food growing off the sides of buildings and on the roofs and inside the buildings and wind capturing devices and solar, I guess you'd call them solar farms, where they have these huge reflective mirrors. They all point to one um, collector which then superheats up an oil, which then stays so hot that it, it circulates through a device that generates electricity through the kerning of a turbine. Um, that's, that's already in existence. I mean, they have about five of these in, in uh, Spain. We've just built three of them in Arizona. Uh, the three together, I think, can power over 500,000 houses for a year just because the sun hits the earth. Um, Sometimes things are so simple that we uh, overlook them because we think, nah, that can't be right, <laughs> but it's right. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's ba I share that future. I, I share that view that he presented because I think that we're smart enough to realize that if we continue to do this, we're all doomed. All right? Now, I mean, there might be a few fringe groups like ISIS or name them that uh, they're not really interested in anything but themselves. They're very selfish people, basically. Uh, but for the rest of the world, everybody else would like generic solutions that they can all apply to their own lives. And I think this is, the hope is that this will morph into a, uh, a very simple, uh, foolproof, robust, easy way of growing food wherever you'd like.